profitable practices. Farm Solutions for People, Profit, and the Planet on Real Agriculture is brought to you by Farm Credit Canada and RBC Royal Bank. Hi, I'm Sean Haney with Real Agriculture. Welcome to Profitable Practices. Today, we're in Mydale, Saskatchewan, and we're at the farm of Colin Rosegren. We're gonna look at how he's incorporating some profitable practices into his farm, in particular, his focus and his use of intercropping to provide not only higher levels of sustainability, but also economic return. Let's go take a look. Uh, Colin Rosengren, a third generation farmer at Mydale. I graduated University of Saskatchewan in 97 and been farming before that and after that and all along, I guess. Okay, uh, what kind of crops are you growing? We grow a wide variety of crops, usually, probably usually about 10 different crops each year. Um, different mixes of, of different ones, I guess basically pulses and oil seeds have been our most common ones to mix up in different intercrops. What is intercropping? Well, I guess that'd be growing uh, two or more crops in the same field. Um, I usually consider it as, as both or all the crops for cash purposes for harvest to consider it intercropping. So I got to ask, this is quite, it's unique. There are, there are people that are doing it. How did you get started intercropping? Uh, I guess the big thing was, was kind of an economic driver. Um, back in 2004, the prices were quite low. Canola, $6, peas, less than $4. Just trying to figure out a way of getting extra yield and, and lower input costs at the same time. Um, and then a lot of it was observations that we'd seen anytime we see volunteer crops coming in another crop it just it it always did a lot better a uh, head of volunteer durham in a barley field for example and the head will be full eight ten row um, the best head of durham you'll ever see so just recognizing that there was an opportunity for another crop to succeed within within a monoculture situation let us think maybe we should plan that and and put some more of something else in there it's a little bit of a mind bender we're used to, we'll call it monocropping. This is, <laughs> this is you know, polycropping, I guess we should call it. Um, wh what do you think it is that creates this one plus one equals three sort of scenario? Well, I, I kind of often end up flipping that around of what makes us think we should grow just one. Um, if we go out there to any natural system, we'll never find just one plant growing because there's always opportunity of time and space and and resources that's more diverse and spread out and so to try and design a single crop to use everything at that same time um, doesn't match the supply and demand curve I guess so anything we can do to flatten out that that demand curve of our crop by spreading out multiple crops is going to help us to match the supply better. Now a lot of people I think jump to harvest okay but I, I want to back it up here because actually the the seeding it, to me, it actually is is a little bit even more interesting and maybe a little bit more complicated. Talk about what happens at seeding time in order to end up with what we see here is multiple crops in the same field. Well, we've adapted that practice over the years as well, but it's not that it it's not complicated or require major stuff. Like I said, we were doing it. We did it, uh, yeah, just about 20 years ago in 2004, and so we did it then with a uh, flexi coil drill with two carts we had a tow between and a tow behind and so we had four compartments and away we went um, it doesn't have to be any more complicated than that um, currently we use a seed tender so that we can have you know five separations out to the drill um, yeah and we we still operate the one drill has a tow between and tow behind cart giving us six compartments so we've got capability of metering six products and the other drill we modified so that it has five metering tanks on it on the seed hawk and and uh, so yeah it's just multiple compartments and just one more layer one more product um, it doesn't really add any total volume so You've, you're even taking this to another level and you're doing variable rate seeding throughout the field that that's uh, even more of a complexity added on here talk about the why of doing that well, yeah, when we, I guess we've always handled our products separately. So um, we always did our fertilizer products separate too and handle our nitrogen separate from phosphorus, separate from sulfur. Um, and the reason being because we recognize the same area of the field doesn't need more of all of them. Um, you have to kind of vary those separately if you're going to do a variable rate management because each site of the field 
needs different amounts of each. Uh, it's similar, I guess, some of the observations we had, like this crop, for example, is pea canola lentil that we do in a variable rate manner. And so those observations would be, if you grow lentils and it's a wet year, for example, people can lose, you know, 30% of their lentil crop in the low area. And for us, those low spots are typically our highest yielding areas. And yet with lentils, you might lose them and it might be flipped around. So it starts to ask the question, why are we seeding lentils in the low spot when, if it was a pea crop, for example, um, that's where our best peas would be. And yet on the hilltop, the peas don't grow very well when it's that dry, they're short and they don't yield well. So, so it's just a matter of, of observing that those plants do better in different areas of the field and let's put more of them there. <laughs> because uh, there are certain products you can't use on certain crops, you're putting a lot of that together. So how do you handle weed control? Well, this one, for example, like pea canola lentil, so this is a clear field canola. Um, peas and lentils, obviously you can use Odyssey on both them. So if this was a lentil crop on its own or a pea crop on its own, we would have Odyssey as a weed control option. And, uh, you know, it's not super strong because the crop isn't that competitive. So a lot of your weed control also comes from your crop competition. And so the fact that we've got, you know, a one and a half times a plant count in this field, basically, um, you know, one and a half to one and two thirds times a normal plant stand here, basically from our seeding rates, that gives us extra competition than you would do in a monoculture. Because if you seeded your peas at one and a half times, then you'd get lodging and disease and those type of problems. But because we've got different plants, we're able to have a higher plant stand, higher competition, and it allows the herbicide like, like the Odyssey to be more effective. Yeah, and, and because in, in this situation, you're kind of, you, you, like you mentioned, you're matching the crop type to the area of the field, you're all, that's another way that you're increasing that plant competition, not letting those weeds uh, sort of have full rain. Yeah, for sure. We've observed over the years, um, things like, like canola, for example, is, is uh, one of our more saline tolerant crops. And so we've observed in a pea canola crop, for example, where, where we had a check strip of peas and where the peas started to come up to the saline area, the peas started to fade out and the kochia started to come up. But in the row beside that, where, the, where we had canola in the crop as well, the canola kept growing into that saline area where the peas stopped and kept the kochia under control, um, at least for quite a bit more distance until the salinity gets real extreme. But, uh, but it definitely expanded that zone of production where we were able to get more productive crop and less weeds in that area. We got peas and canola in, in this field. Harvest. <laughs> <laughs> talk, talk about harvest because I think this like I said earlier this is the one that everybody jumps to in terms of like the roadblocks the challenges yeah. the reason it won't work and it definitely is the more challenging part so when we started we were just you know the first year we just did a quarter section kind of thing um, we were running uh, a large drum cleaner so it was a I think a GT or a hutch or something like that sort of four foot diameter drum 12 feet long they work all right, but uh, you know, we were juggling augers to the bin, you know, set up two augers, set up the cleaner, and then the bin fills up and you juggle everything around. Um, certainly not a, not a practice for large scale. So over the years we ended up developing or building a, a cleaning plant at home with a centralized handling system. Um, and now we're just hitting the, the third stage of that, I guess, where as the farm is spread out, the centralized handling and bringing it home to clean is no longer a good option. And so we're, currently building a mobile cleaner where we're going to separate these in the field and then haul them home as separate products. Clearly, because you, you're committed to this practice, you're seeing results. And, and we're talking about profitable practices here on this series. So wh how, how have you measured the results? What's, uh, how do you judge whether, you know, hey, this is working, we need to continue? Basically, we put it in the spreadsheet at the end of the day and see what the net returns are. Um, I mean, that's the goal of every every business I guess and so so yeah those are the the key metrics for us too is is really been the net returns out of it and um, you know the long-term benefits that that we like to talk about or the soil health or this and that they're really hard to quantify and you know I'd love to tell you yeah we've got such and such a number is higher because we do this practice or whatever but there's there's nothing I can really put down on paper to to tell you that but the net returns are are pretty solid and um, indisputable, I guess. So that's our main driver. Truly a profitable practice. It has been for us, yeah.